الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله ربي زدني علما قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فمن يرد الله أن يهديه يشرح صدره للإسلام ومن يرد أن يضله يجعل صدره ضيقا حرجا كأنما يصعد في السماء كذلك يجعل الله كذلك يجعل الله الرجس على الذين لا يؤمنون صدق الله العظيم The ayah that I have picked for you come from Surah Al-An'am This is ayah number 125. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about two different kinds of people. We're going to spend some time on this ayah and understanding some of the things in this ayah. And then we're going to be moving on, connecting this ayah with the person of the day. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ If Allah wishes to guide anybody, if Allah wills to have His mercy on an individual and guides that person, يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ Islam Opens up his heart. What does that mean? Opens up his understanding, his thought process towards goodness. And the best of the best goodness that we can find in this planet Earth and this entire universe is the guidance. And the guidance that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rightly guided guidance which has an end result of Jannah. The guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al-Fatiha, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you're asking guidance, ask, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ مَلَى الضَّالِّينَ Ask me that, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, guide me. Put me on the path of those people that are rightly guided and with an end goal of Jannah. And do not, meet, do not put me among those people who are to be misguided and they may be thinking all their life that they're guided. There are two kinds of people. The people who are stubborn, they know they're misguided and they want to live that life. There are people around us who say, yes, we believe there is no God. What were you going to say? And then there are people out there who think that they're right, but they're not. They think the problem is the thinking of right and wrong doesn't lies in us. It comes as a guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right from the beginning when Adam alayhi salam was sent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made one principle. فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَىٰ When the guidance comes to you from me, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَىٰ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ and then when the guidance come to you, when you pick that guidance, then you don't have to worry about it. on the day when people will be extremely worried about which will be the day of judgment. This is one state Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in this ayah. Say, وَمَن يُرِدْ أَن يُضِلَّهُ And the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decide not to put His mercy on. And it is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like that individual. It is that individual that doesn't likes himself or herself and decides with all the rationality in their head not to follow the right path when right path is shown and given to them. We have so many examples to look at in the lives of the prophets. The dad of Ibrahim alayhi salam, day and night he's interacting with his dad, but he doesn't want to accept it. In the end, he says, Ibrahim, if you keep saying what you're saying, I will put you to death. I'll stone you to death. We see in the capacity of Nuh alayhi salam, his own son, Kina'an, he's trying to make sure that, oh my son, even till his last moment, come with us. Come on this ship. There is nobody to save you today, except for if you are guided. La Asim, there is no savior today. Al Yawm, this day. But he chose not to go that route. In the times of Musa alayhi salam, he comes with open signs to Fir'aun, but he chose not to pick it up. Rather, he turns around to his people and says, 
I don't know any but other God to be worshipped. Ilahan ghayri, except for me. And oh people, ala rabbukum ala I am the guy who feeds you all. How can I accept somebody else's God? That's his thought process. We go at the time of Isa alayhi salam. He's coming to his people, showing them the right path. But people are accusing him that you are a false prophet. We will not going to listen to you. He's showing them miracles day and night. They're amused, but not willing to accept. At the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Kitab al-Mubin, open book, presented to the people of Quraysh. It was given to them in their own language, in their own dialect. They would listen to it, get amazed by it, yet not accept it. We have a long list of names, and these are not people in every walk of life. These are the chiefs of their own tribes. These are the people who travel all around the Arabia, and they're very successful businessmen of their times. Abu Jahl ibn Hisham, his real name was Amr. His uncle, who's the dad of Khalid ibn Walid, the Walid himself, Utba bin Rabi'ah and Shayba bin Rabi'ah, the two guys who were heading the tribe of Banu Umayyah. Abu Sufyan himself didn't get guided until very much later on. The dad of Amr ibn As, As bin Wa'il al Sahmi, he's leading his tribe of Banu Sahm. There are so many people in the household of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. For example, Abu Lahab, the neighbor and the uncle. Not guided. It's not like they were not understanding the message. It was like they were getting it denied. And we have examples of that in the Quran. Where the man accepted Islam. He accepted Islam, but when his friends forced him, he not only rejected Islam, but he spat towards the Prophet. He spat towards the Prophet. And he thought he is now holding on to his worldly friends. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this individual who is also happened to be the neighbor of the Prophet, that on the day of judgment, he will be like, oh my God, who did I pick as my friend? That friend was my enemy. Why did I pick him as my khalila? Why did I do that? And we live in times where there's a peer pressure. And we make certain decisions based on that peer pressure. Because we do not want to lose now. And a lot of us don't think about future. Some of us think about future, but only in terms of worldly affairs. But that's about it. What about the life hereafter? Where did I come from? Where am I going to go? My final destiny. How often will we ponder about that? So there are a lot of people in Medina. The guy who was about to become the king of Medina. Abdullah. His name. Look at his name. Abdullah. The servant of Allah. Ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He is the chief of the hypocrites. Ra'is al-Munafiqeen. He would stand up in the masjid and would tell people, Oh, keep quiet everybody. It's Juma time. The Prophet is on the mimbar. Listen to him. And in his heart, he was the most dangerous person for the people of Medina. He wouldn't let go any moment that he wouldn't hurt them. He left them in the middle of the battlefield. With one third of the army he left. This is the kind of a person who doesn't let go anything backstabbing. Not physically, but emotionally. He was the guy who was running the rumor mill when people were accusing Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha for something that she did not commit. It. He was the guy who started the rumor mill. A guy in this capacity. Yet then we look at the mercy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He knows this is a hypocrite. He is leading the hypocrites. But when his son, who is a staunch believer, Abdullah bin Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the father is a hypocrite, chief of hypocrites. The son is a very firm believer. Comes to the Prophet and says, My dad has passed away. If you could grant me your shirt, I will put it on him and we will bury it. Maybe he will be forgiven. And despite all what this guy has done, Prophet still grants his shirt. 
even goes to his qabr, his grave. And he wants to do the dua for this individual. Maybe he's forgiven. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who steps forward and says, Ya Rasulullah, this is the Ra'is al-Munafiqeen. This is the chief of the hypocrites. Please don't do so. And the Prophet said, No, I'll do it. Maybe he's forgiven. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that in taghfir lahum sab'ina marratan, even if you ask for forgiveness for them 70 times, I will not going to forgive these people. The Prophet said, I may ask for more. I may ask for more. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after what moment was passed, revealed the Quran and said, O oh Prophet, you must not come to these people's grave. You should not pray for them. Why? It's not because they did not accept me. They accepted me. His name was Abdullah. But they never accepted you. They rejected you. They mock you. And the shahada, the witness, cannot be completed until and unless you say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah is not enough. Without the love and the respect of the Prophet. And the believing in the Prophet, that he is the Prophet of God, the final messenger of God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُرِدْ أَن يُضِلَّهُ يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَسْعَدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ And the one that he decides not to guide because that person has done atrocities against his own soul, he closes his heart, makes it tight, makes it limited. That he hear, has ears but he doesn't listen. He has mouth but can speak. He has eyes but cannot see. Summun, bukmun, umyun, fahum la They cannot return back. That's it. And their hearts are filled with sickness. Allah increase the sickness. If you want to be sick, okay, that's your choice. And now they're coming out and saying, our hearts are closed. No, your hearts are not closed. You put a lock on it, Allah says. You yourself put a lock on it. You are kind of a guy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, that there is a fire that gives light in the darkness, but you decide to close your eyes. Do not be like a donkey. يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارُ That the books are on the back of the donkey, but doesn't benefit from it. Is this, or has this ummah turned into that donkey itself? That Allah talks about the Yahud, the Nasara. They have the book of Allah, but not getting guidance from it. We have the book of Allah, the Mus'haf. How do we get our guidance from the book is the question. That is a very big question for us. How much guidance do we extract from that book? Do we only open when it's accustomed to open it? When somebody is deceased, we call some imam to come over and recite on the person who is gone. When the baby is born, we just recite something on the baby. When somebody is getting married, we just call somebody to do some recitation at the beginning of the marriage ceremony. Is this book only for people who have retired from the workforce and they have nothing else to do? Or the people who are so early in their school life that they are the one who should be taught the Qur'an. But as soon as I get hit middle school, I'm so busy. As soon as I hit high school, I'm more busy. As soon as I hit college, I am the busiest person on the face of earth. And I forget everything that Allah does for me. And He's the first one that I forget. And when I'm in workforce, oh my God, I'm flying like a bird. I have no time for nobody. These are the things to look back. It is easy to pinpoint at others. It is difficult to look back. I told you something that in this ayah I'll talk about one thing. Dayyqan haraja. Dayyqan haraja. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu happened to run into a person from a tribe of Banu Mudlaj. He asked him, what is haraja? What is it? How do you Arabs, the Bedouin, explain it? He said, Ya Umar, 
Have you ever seen trees, a lot of trees, so close to each other that you can't even go past through them? And right in the middle of those trees, there's another tree which is impossible to get to. He said, yeah, I've seen such kind of trees. He said, that tree that is impossible to get to for any living thing, this is haraj. This is how the hearts of the disbelievers become because of their constant denial. And this is the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on them that their hearts get to be this way. Now since we're talking about Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and as, as I said earlier, we'll talk about her personality of the day because recently was the day, day that he passed away 14 some hundred years ago. So I'm going to share with you maybe one or two stories from his life. It's not like we need to repeat these stories just for the sake of repeating them. It's not like we got to replicate the exact same thing that he did. Rather, the idea is to extract the moral from the story and work on it as an individual or whatever capacity we have. Now, one day, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu walks into his house. His wife presents him with food. And the food also has what we commonly call in Urdu or in English, ghee. In Arabic, it is salmon. If you want to really understand as an English-speaking person who has no idea about any of those two languages, it's the purified butter. And he looks at it and says, this is a lavish food. Where did you get it? And he is what? He is the ruler of the land more than Alexander the Great could even imagine. Where did you get this? <laughs> This is lavishness. And she said, this is not from your money, Arma. This is from my money. I spent 60 dirham, 60 coins of my own wealth, so that you could eat it. He said, I'm not going to even touch it. She said, why? He said, how can Arma touch a lavishness in the food when I am not 100% sure in my entire kingdom if all people are even fed? What is this? This is the responsibility, accountability. Each one of us has some accountability to look up to. Nobody is without an accountability. If I'm going to school as a kid, my accountability is to excel, to give my 100%. Because I will be held accountable for not performing when I had all ways of doing it. All ways of doing it. Similarly, if I'm at work, same deal. If I'm at house, kullukum ra'ayun. We are all like shepherds. And our responsibilities are like sheep. As a shepherd herd the sheep and doesn't lose any, and if he loses any, that's the most horrible day of his life. That sense of responsibility needs to come back in the lives of a believer. And responsibility also includes not sinning. How can I sin on the land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is not mine? That is. And whatever I'm sinning with is not mine either. That's his. Remember when some calamity hits, what are the words we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. It was his. And he took it away. It was his, is the concept that those people lived with, that we talk about today. Be it in the capacity of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, be it in the capacity of Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Hussein, Sayyidina Hassan, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Bilal ibn Rabah, Names goes on and on and on. Ammar ibn Yasir. His whole family was tortured to death. Whole family. He was the only survivor in Mecca. His brother, his dad, his mom, all gone. Khabbab ibn Arat. These, they didn't have easy life. What was with them that helped them survive? In the times of Medina, when people ask Khabab, Khabab, because they never saw the life in Makkah. 
They didn't know how brutal the people of Makkah were because now they have all accepted Islam. He said, Ya Khabab, how was the life in Makkah when you were a poor man? All Khabab did, he uplifted his shirt and all his back had holes. Deep. He said, how did this happen? He said, when I believed, they would put burning rocks on ground and they would put me on it. And the only thing that would extinguish those rocks would be whatever would excrete from my wounds. This was the life in Makkah. Now when you look back and we look now, what is it that we don't have? Yet, we are in the capacity of complaining. Rather than excelling, our hearts have hardened up. Rather than being happy, we are depressed and sad. Remember a couple weeks ago, I gave you two words from Arabic language. Kun anta. Be yourself. The biggest problem that you and I face every day is, what will people say? Don't worry about what will people say. We need to change our thought process. What will Allah say? What will Allah say? And that needs, that needs to come from within. That needs to come in within. If I have long beard, I started dressing up like that somebody would look and say, oh, must be a very pious guy. That doesn't help. That's hypocrisy. Because deep inside I'm, I'm devil. So it is the heart that needs to change. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the heart and says, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ الله. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to help out, what does He do? Opens up their heart. Opens up their heart to guidance, to the truth. So that it comes from within and not just from outside. Because when it comes from within, it has its effect on outside. It has its effect on outside because you have opened the door of acceptance. And you can tell the right from wrong. And this is one of the common problems we notice with our youth because they have not opened the door. Whatever comes their way, they grab it. Because they're not thinking through that door. They're thinking that whatever is in here, if it looks good to me, I'll pick it. If it doesn't look good to me, I'll lose it. But the problem is, I can't decide the right and wrong. Allah decides right and wrong. I can't just pick anything and everything that I like because I like it. It's quite possible you like something and it's okay to like it. It's quite possible that we may like something which is not okay to like it. So at the end of the day, the final judgment lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's exactly what he tells us in Surah Al-Fatiha. Maliki yawmiddin. I am the king when things shall be exchanged. And the final judgment shall be passed. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم.